My creed as a Canadian is summed up in these words. I am a Canadian, a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship God in my own way, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I believe wrong, free to choose those who shall govern my country. This heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and all mankind, for I am a Canadian. On December the 17th, 1941, a badly damaged Spitfire aircraft of the Royal Canadian Air Force staggered to a landing on an airfield outside London, its pilot dead. That pilot was John Gillespie McGee, a boy of 19 years of age, a man for all generations. In his tunic was a sonnet he had written on the back of a letter to his mother, words that live today and always will. I would like to read those words to you now. slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. There must be a realization by all of us that we're Canadians, that we disagree. If we all thought alike, nobody would be thinking. The man who sits opposite is just as conscientiously in favor of his country and the betterment of that country than the one who sits with you as a colleague. I'll give you an example. It has to do with British politics. In 1961, the Right Honorable Harold McMillan, the Prime Minister, had my wife and me to dinner. She sat to his right, and on the other side of her was the indomitable and the incomparable Sir Winston Churchill. I was on the other side of the table, far down. I was introduced to a Mrs. Chamberlain. I said to her, seeing Sir Winston in the happiest of good humor, engaged in the warmest of conversations with my wife and Mr. McMillan. I said, it's wonderful to see the old man so happy. Yes, she said. It's wonderful that he's here, too. For you and I would not be here but for him. The speaker was Mrs. Neville Chamberlain, 
who died very recently and was speaking of the man who had driven her husband out of public life. That's my idea of parliamentary government. The first time I met Winston Churchill was in 1941 in December. I had seen him in the gallery, from the gallery of the House of Commons in 1916 when he was in disgrace following Gallipoli. When he got up to speak with the mud of France on his uniform, the house emptied. I saw him in 1932 when he was a pariah. I saw him in 1936 when he became the king's man at the time of the abdication. I saw him in 1939. I said to him, Prime Minister, the first time I saw you, you were in disgrace. His answer, which time was that? Uh, I happened to be a teetotaler, and the first occasion that my wife and I were at lunch at Churchill's was in 1957. All during the luncheon, he was reaching down. I wonder what he was reaching for. Finally, he came up with a bottle, which even to my unpracticed eye represented uh, one of the few remaining portions of Napoleonic brandy. It was about half full, the bottle. He said, will you have some? And I said, I never take any. And he put his earpiece on so that he could hear me more clearly. I said, I'm a teetotaler. And he said, you're a what? Are you a prohibitionist? And I said, no. It was a prohibitionist who beat you in, in Dundee in 1920. And he said, yes, I had very bad luck that year. I had two or three defeats in succession. And he said, uh, so you're not Lake Scrimger, who was the successful candidate against him on that occasion? I said, no, I'm a teetotaler, but not a prohibitionist. He found difficulty in understanding that. His wife helped out. Finally, he got it clear. He said, what you say is this, that you are a teetotaler and not a prohibitionist. I said, that's right. Oh, in that case, you only hurt yourself. Churchill was terrible when the time. I was there the day that, in 51, when the conservative member left and went over to the labor side because they didn't expect the old man would win again, you see. Well, Churchill watched him. Finally, the member came to rest in the far back seat the church said, Mr. Speaker, this is the first time in recorded history that anyone has ever seen a rat swimming towards a sinking ship. First time I spoke with R.B. was in 1917. I had just come back from overseas and I was still in uniform. He was terrific. First time I heard Bennett speak was in 1904 at the little schoolhouse at Fort Carlton where my father taught. Uh, there were no more than 17 present and Bennett spoke for two hours and a half. And when Bennett spoke, he, his delivery was, a, I think, an average of 175 words a minute. In those days, Richard B. Bennett was known as Richard Bonfire. Oh, he was terrific. I'm sitting over there, and R.B. says, I didn't send you a wedding present, did I? No, didn't know. I said, I've been married for years. They, um, well, he said, anyway, I can give you a picture. And he reaches in this drawer, and he brought out a picture that size in his Windsor uniform. 
and he had a very large middle and rather spindly ankles. He inscribed the photograph, he handed it over to me. I didn't think that my face betrayed any emotion at all. He reached over and he grabbed it, he said, you do not like it. He took it out of my hands, put it back in the drawer, and I never had the picture from Mr. Bennett. However, I didn't go home for about a month, and when I got there, I was informed that there was something wrong with my trust account. And I was disturbed, I said, I've never touched my trust account. No, we're over. Somebody anonymously deposited it to my account. That was the wedding present. And we had a member by the name of Billy Essling. He was about 75, eight years of age and blind, loved by everybody. He could recognize every member in the house who spoke by his voice. He loved all mankind but Dukabors. He had them in his constituency. And they, from time to time, used to go on nocturnal or even day walks clad in their native raiment. And uh, he said, it's getting very serious, Billy Essling said, that these women march about in this way to the discomfiture of our people. Sitting directly opposite, because he was sitting with the whip, there was a, a chuckle. It was the chuckle of the Prime Minister. And uh, Billy said, the Prime Minister laughs. I ask him a question. What would he do some morning if he were to arise at Kingsmere and see a half a dozen Duke of War women totally devoid of all raiment? <laughs> he said, I ask. And Mackenzie King, for the first and only time in his life, showed any sense of humor. He said, I would immediately call in the leader of the opposition. Bennett was indignant. He rose. He said, Mr. Speaker, the right honorable gentleman exaggerates. Dispensing patronage outside of his own party has never been characteristic of him. <laughs> 